Hey there, welcome back to another video. This time it is another unboxing video, as well as, I think I'm going to call this a vlog. Um, this is a, or a vlog, as, as a lot of other people tend to call it. I've just been used to calling it a vlog for so many years now. Um, so, uh, I'm going to be showing a couple uh, gifts that were sent to me in the mail. I'm also going to be showing uh, some uh, flicks and stuff that I picked up recently. And giving my thoughts on a few things... Um, uh, uh, news wise and give you another update on what's coming next on the channel. So, um, and I'm also going to read a couple letters that were sent to me by Jonathan. Um, he sent me one a while back, uh, for a package, uh, that included Death Wish and a few other films. And I misplaced the letter while I was reorganizing my room. So I wasn't able to, uh, record, uh, myself reading the letter at that point in time, but I found it now, so I will definitely do that. But I'm going to start out, though, with uh, talking about a package that was sent to me by Brandon. He sent me some stuff in the past, and um, he sent me this uh, plastic uh, bag full of a bunch of different stuff, um, trading cards, uh, Becky Lynch uh, sticker. Becky Lynch is a... Uh, women's wrestler in WWE, she's been so screwed over. I mean, she really honestly deserved deserves way better than what she's gotten lately in WWE. She's been lost uh, in the shuffle, and it's really too bad because she's really talented, and she's a great personality, and I don't know why she's not had the title recently. It's just Charlotte, Charlotte, more Charlotte, and now with uh, the rise of Ronda Rousey, there's going to be even less uh, room for Becky Lynch. So, some trading cards. You got Brock Lesnar. Uh, the the shield, which is pretty cool. Um, forgive the blurriness. I turned off my autofocus because it causes issues. Um, but really, the cards don't look this bad in real life. <laughs> you, go, you, you go on and like, oh my god, it looks so bad. I can't even read anything. So that's Seth Rollins, CrossFit Jesus. Um, so yeah, there's some trading cards. Uh, this is the um, sticker, Becky Lynch sticker. Uh, I don't know where I'll put this. I'll put it somewhere. Um, and this is a See No Evil poster. I'm not like the biggest fan ever of the movie, but it's it's all right. It's a gift that can you know it's the it's the, it's the thought that counts. I almost said the gift that counts, but that's not true. Trust me. It was just, it was just, it was just a, it was a mental error. Um, I haven't recorded a video in a couple days, so I'm a bit rusty. Um, but yeah, okay. Seen a Weevil poster. That's pretty cool. I mean, at least it wasn't a poster of Seen a Weevil 2. <laughs> that's a true piece of shit right there. Um, so yeah, there's some, a wrestling sticker, a See No Evil poster, some more, uh, wrestling trading cards, pretty cool, but the main gift he sent me was the Best of Sting from Impact Wrestling, which was, which is also known as TNA, um, I am really glad to have this because I'm a huge Sting Mark, huge Sting fan. This is the only Sting uh, best of disc uh, or set that I did not have because I already got recently the first TNA Sting set, uh, The Return of an Icon. And I watched this recently. I'll save some of my thoughts for this for a separate video uh, where I briefly start a new series called Talking TNA, which is which is going to be uh, like talking WWE, but I'm going to be talking about TNA instead. Um, yeah, there's some fun matches on here, but uh, I, I, I'm just going to save my thoughts for later on that. So this one has a uh, bunch of different matches on here and some interviews and stuff like that. This was actually released by TNA around the same time that uh, WWE's first Best of Sting DVD and Blu-ray was released. So... Um, this one has his return match to TNA, uh, which is also on the previous set. It's got a world title match between Sting and Kurt Angle, a steel cage match, Sting versus Mick Foley, 
Uh, Sting versus the Nature Boy, Ric Flair. Sting versus Mr. Anderson versus Rob Van Dam. World title match, Sting versus Jeff Hardy. It's not the, it's not the one that happened uh, at one pay-per-view where Hardy was drunk off his ass and, and high on pills or something. That That's, that's not the match that's on here, uh, thankfully. Uh, Sting versus the Immortal Hulk Hogan. That's 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 a really bad match. I mean, at, at first I was like, it's not that bad, but then I tried to rewatch it recently. It's pretty bad because it's one of those matches that it's a bunch of old guys just trying to recapture their old glory, and they're definitely way past their prime, and it shows. Um, Sting versus uh, yeah Hulk Hogan, his induction in the TNA Hall of Fame, and a few other ones, probably some different clips and stuff like that, like. Joker Sting and whatever. I, I I really was not a fan of Joker Sting. Uh, that's that's not one of my f- favorite personas from Sting. Uh, well, you know, but I mean, it's not like he's a stranger to to embarrassing moments. He's done a lot of that in his career. And it, when he first came to TNA and he had his first uh uh moment in the ring when he's talking uh on camera. And he's in the impact zone. He say, God, Sting. I love Sting, but this is embarrassing. He, he, he goes in and he says, the Sting Zizzle is in his house. The sister, it's the Stazinger is in his house. You're just like, for fuck's sake, Steve, Steve Borden. I'm I'm just going to call you by your real name because that's Steve. Come on, man. That's just, that's embarrassing. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that makes you kind of hard. It kind of makes it kind of hard to be a fan of Sting when he's going around with a microphone, and he's all like, "The Stazinger is in his house." <laughs> You're just like, "Come on, man, that's bad." But anyway, um, what's not bad is uh, this gift. Uh, thank you, Brandon, for sending me this, as well as the other goodies. Now, uh, now we get to. The box of goodies from Jonathan Lindsay. <laughs> uh, this is really, really, really cool. I, I, man, this is awesome. It's a live trilogy from Scream Factory. Wow. Um, this is the three disc set. Has a ton of different features on it. Uh, this is a definite upgrade over my DVD. I love Larry Cohen. Um, I'm a huge fan of his work and I actually like these movies. I was surprised by a lot of them. Um, especially the third one. I thought it was going to suck and I actually didn't mind it. So this is the first film. It's alive. Um, this has an audio commentary with a writer, producer slash director, Larry Cohen, uh, new Cohen's alive. Looking back at the it's alive films featuring interviews with writer, producer, Larry Cohen, actors, James Dixon, uh, Michael Moriarty, uh, Lorraine Landon, and more. So it's like a feature-length documentary on the It's Alive films, which is really, really cool. I can't wait to check that out sometime. It's got, it gets to that, blah, 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 because I'm so excited. I'm so excited. I just can't hide it. Uh, I, I, I can't, like, and then I also can't talk, apparently. Uh, theatrical trailer, radio spots, TV spot, and a still gallery. So, um, yeah, this is really cool. It's also got a uh, reversible sleeve, which is weird. I don't remember this cover. This poster is strange. And it's on the disc, too. The font. It's like this... Like That's pretty gross looking. What is that, like placenta or something? Like, that's... Okay, all right. Wow. I definitely prefer this cover art, that's for sure. Um, there's only one thing... There's only one thing wrong with the Davis baby. The one film you should not see alone. It's alive. And then we have It Lives Again, the sequel. The It's Alive baby is back. Only now, there are three of them. Uh, This one has a commentary with Larry Cohen, theatrical trailer, TV spot, and still gallery. And the 1080p uh, version of the film. And uh, reversible cover art as well. Um, the one with the birthday cake, it's okay, but I'm actually going to slip, slip this around, flip this around, not slip it around, uh, and have it be the, uh, multiple different, uh, baby 
carriage. They're not really carriages, but they're kind of are. But cri cribs, the multiple different baby cribs, because I think that that just looks so much. Because they're companion uh, posters, really. So the first poster is like this, and then the second poster is like that as well. So I think it's pretty cool. So it's alive, and it's alive too. And then It's Alive Trilogy would not be complete without It's Alive 3, Island of the Alive. They do something worse than kill. They multiply. Um, this one only has one uh, cover, but um, that's fine. This has a commentary with Larry Cohen and an interview with Steve Neal, the makeup effects artist. So that's pretty cool. And yeah, I thought this, this one surprised me. Uh, new show I thought it was going to be crap, but nope. Michael Moriarty comes in and saves it. And there's a few other things about it that are pretty cool. I'm actually looking forward to revisiting these sometime because the reviews I did of these was such a long time ago that um, my memory is not so fresh. Also, they're uh, reviews that were recorded with like a crappy camera. So I, I, I'm definitely open and willing to uh, doing something else and new with it. So... Um, Nice. So that's uh, that's a live trilogy. He also sent me Killer Clowns from Outer Space. Killer Clowns from Outer Space, uh, the Arrow Video Collector's Edition. This is really cool. This has the booklet as well as the disc and reversible cover art. Um, but it also has a slip, slip cover. It's crazy. This one has a brand new 4K remastering of the film. Um, optional English subtitles, blah de blah, blah. An audio commentary with the Kyoto Brothers. Let the show begin. The anatomy of a killer theme song. An all new interview with the Dickies. Uh, the Kyoto, the Kyotos walk among among us. Their adventures in Super 8 filmmaking. A documentary highlighting the making of their childhood films. Uh, killer collection of their early films. A tour of of Kyoto Brothers Productions. Tales of Tobacco, an interview with star Grant Kramer. Debbie's Big Night, an interview with Suzanne Snyder. Uh, the Making of Killer Clowns, an interview with the Kyoto Brothers. I think th these are all uh, different uh, features that were on the MGM DVD and Blu-ray. So uh, it does port over the same features from the Blu-ray as well as a few other extra stuff. And a 4K remaster of the film. So even if you do have the film on DVD or on Blu-ray, um, this is still a... Uh, worthwhile grab if you're a fan of the film because it has a new print and a new remaster of the film on it also uh you know i, I just i really enjoy this movie it's a lot of fun it's kooky it's crazy it's entertaining and uh i had it on my wish list because i wanted to see the new transfer as well as a few of the other features it's a little bit disappointing in terms of like the new features there isn't that much but then again it does port over the old features and though there was a decent amount so and the 4K transfer definitely makes it worth it. So, so again, thank you, Jonathan, for that. Forgive, forgive, uh, forgive me for any kind of audio interference or something. I accidentally hit the uh, microphone. But uh, also, this is cool. Screen Factory release of of unknown origin. If it can't scare them to death, it will find another way. Um, I'm so glad this has finally gotten a Blu-ray release. This is such an underrated gem this has a 2k scan so it has a new remastered a print it's got an interview with uh, pierre david and screenwriter brian taggart and it ports over the commentary track from the dvd um it's too bad that there is no uh interview with peter weller but apparently he was asked and he refused which is interesting because he did a commentary track for it, but I guess he didn't want to do interviews. It seems like that's kind of how he is lately. I remember hearing from somebody who met him at uh, a screening of something and or an autograph signing, and they were all and he was all uh, demonstrative about how he can't believe that anybody would give a crap about his older movies, about a bunch of old movies, and he just it seems like he's really bitter right now for some reason and doesn't really want to talk about movies. It's like he feels like that's in the past and, you know, his career now is 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 past that he because he's a professor and he I guess he just thinks I don't know. I, I doesn't he doesn't think very highly of it. It's one of those things like I don't really get it. I don't understand. But, you know, 
I still love Peter. He's still one of my favorite actors, and I will. I'm definitely looking forward to watching uh, the remastered uh, print of this someday. And I, uh, this is a good. Uh, this is a this is good timing because I was gonna do a Peter Weller uh, filmography video. So um, now I have the Blu-ray to show instead of uh, the uh, DVD. Ah, okay. Now I just heard about this one. Um, I was watching a video by this uh, YouTuber named Jello Apocalypse who does these fun uh, animated videos. And he was reviewing the Studio Ghibli films and he mentioned this one. And I was like, okay, all right, that might be kind of fun. And this is uh, Palm Poco. Um, this is a different, uh, this is another uh, Studio Ghibli movie. So, okay, all right. Okay, I'll, I'll give this a watch sometime for the... Studio Ghibli anime collection. And then he also sent me David Lynch's Wild at Heart. I know there's a Blu-ray that came out recently, but I've never seen this film. So I can't really say for sure whether or not I want it. So, But I'm, I'm glad I have this because I've been curious about it for Nicolas Cage, Laura Dern, and it's a David Lynch film. Plus this has a decent amount of features. I mean, it has a new transfer for the DVD it's got a making of documentary and it's got a few other things. So, you know, that's pretty cool. I believe William, yeah, William Defoe is also, also in this as well as Crispin Glover and Harry Dean Stanton. So that's pretty cool. So, um, all of this is really cool to be honest. So he also sent me a letter and I'm going to save this letter and the second one for last because, um, I want to have that be the finale. Now I'm going to get to some stuff that I picked up myself. Got this at Goodwill recently. Showgirls, Teen Wolves, and Astro Zombies. A film critic's year-long quest to find the worst movie ever made. So far, this is a really fun read. I've had this on my wish list on Amazon ever since I had an Amazon account, which is years ago. So I finally found this recently, and it was worth the wait. Um, this guy has got a nice uh, sense of humor about him. And, uh, yeah, and he also goes the extra mile and tries to do some interviews with people and a few other things. And any guy who's friend, who was friends with George Romero is, is in, is, is in good company with me. So, um, yeah, if you're a fan of bad movies, like if you're a Mystery Science Theater 3000 fan or something like that, or you, you're into the Razzies, pick this book up sometime. It's definitely worth a read. Now we have a bunch of different combos of stuff. I got some DVDs and some Blu-rays. These are all things I got from either Goodwill or Pawn Shop or a thrift store. We got Fatso, a Dom DeLuise film. This was uh, a good find. I would say this is my uh, top find recently that I found in the wild because this is out of print. It uh, has, has been out of print for a while. Copies of this go for at least over 20 bucks used on Amazon and I got it for two dollars so it was it was a it was a steal um, and I've been curious about this one too because I like Dom DeLuise and this is more of a dramatic role for him and uh, and for the longest time I was curious about seeing the movie and now I have the DVD and I can check it out sometime RPG a real playing game with Rucker Hauer uh, it was one of those buy three get one free type things at buybacks and yeah, the sticker, they changed their stickers, and now they're cheap, and they're paying the ass to take off, and I'd rather just leave them on there. Uh, I like Rucker Hauer, and the idea was sounded kind of interesting. For cheap, you know, why not? Uh, Redemption with Chris Penn and uh, Don the Dragon Wilson, James Russo, and Cynthia Rothrock. Um, I had this on VHS, so I thought, why not pick it up on DVD? Bruce Campbell and My Name is Bruce. I've heard a lot of good things about this. I know my friend Matt does not like this. He's not a fan of it. But for the Bruce Campbell collection, why not? Got it at a pawn shop for a dollar. Uh, old Boy. Because I heard a decent amount of stuff about this. And uh, this is in a pretty good... This is in pretty good shape. So, um, yeah, I thought, why not? It was only $2, so get it for the collection. The Pirates of Penzance. Uh, it's a musical ba uh, based on a Broadway show and uh, features pretty much the same cast from the Broadway 
a musical. I think it's the exact same cast. Uh, Kevin Klein, Linda Ronstadt, uh, and Rex Smith, who, uh, if you're familiar with the film The Pilot and the, t- and the TV series Street Hawk, it's Street Hawk himself. Oh, and he also played Daredevil in Trial of the Incredible Hulk. And then I also got uh, National Lampoon's movie Madness. This is the film they did after Animal House, I think. And uh, I was curious about it. Essentially, it's an anthology film because there's three different stories. And it's got uh, early performances by Diane Lane, Candy Clark, and Christopher Lloyd. And then I got Pootie Tang. I've heard about this movie, but I've never seen it. And uh, apparently Louis C.K. wrote and directed this. And I I remember seeing somewhere that this was uh, out of print, but I'm not sure. One thing I've noticed about these Paramount DVDs I thought was interesting is that they are... The the quality of them is cheap as hell. Like some of these early... No, I mean later Paramount releases. Like the discs are thinner than some of the other discs... And they feel like they're going to break. It's almost like it's more like a CD than a DVD. It's it's interesting. Um, at least for someone like me, who's a collector. Uh, probably for a lot of other people, it's like, I don't care. It's not very interesting. What are you talking about? Um, then I also got The Fate of the Furious for the Fast and Furious collection. Mom and Dad, because I was curious about this. Got it for $2. Now, it doesn't have the Blu-ray... I got it for so cheap at a, at a uh, thrift store because it only had the DVD. But with this movie, there's no features anyway. And it's a newer film, so it'll look just as good on DVD as it probably would have on Blu-ray. So, um, And I got a physical copy of it, so win-win. Terminal Velocity on Blu-ray, because I actually enjoy the film quite a bit. wanted to get it on Blu-ray. Hansel and Gretel, Witch Hunters, and Rated Cut. You have no idea how long I've been trying to get this. I it, Every time I'd see it, it was for a little bit too much I wanted to spend. And then I finally found it for like $2. So I was like, yeah, sure, why not? And this is another one that's been on my wish list for a while. Last Dance with Sharon Stone. Heard a lot of good things about it. And I like the trailer. So um, that's it for uh, the DVDs and Blu-rays. There's actually one other thing. There's actually there's a few things I want to show you. I just got to get up and get them because they're items that I have to grab and to show you. Um, all right. So these are some horror magazines. I got them recently. Uh, I got a good deal on them from uh, a Facebook group and from a friend of mine. He uh, was getting rid of some magazines. I saw that he had two Fangoria magazines, and so I offered uh, to um, pay for them. And um, so, yeah, I got Horror Hound. Uh, This is uh, issue number 18. I got this because it's Tales from the Crypt. It's it's, a special Tales from the Crypt uh, issue. It also talks about a lot of different horror anthologies. So it's a horror anthology Tales from the Crypt issue. So um, as a gigantic Tales from the Crypt fan, I, I definitely wanted to get get my hands on it for for the collection. Um, and Horror Hound's pretty cool. Horror Hound is um, this is actually where Horror's Hallowed Grounds started was in a uh, Horror Hound magazine. So yeah. So this is pretty cool. Definitely glad to add this to my collection. Um, I'm, I'm trying to get more horror mags because... Especially Fangoria, because I'm a big Fangoria fan. And Fangoria is one of those uh, that I think back issues as years go by are going to become harder and harder to find. Uh, it, especially for uh, affordable prices. So I'm just trying to get as many as I can you know, while I can. And I got a decent amount. I got a good amount of them through a trade with a friend of mine and a few others with another deal for their Facebook group. So here we have uh, uh, another... Here's an issue of Fangoria. This one talks about the horror show and uh, Freddy's Nightmares. This is issue number... Uh, what, this is uh, April... I think it's April 1989. 
they normally have the issue number on here like they normally say what issue it is it's not giving me that oh yeah it's number 81 issue number 81 then I have number 10 Fangoria number 10 was scan about scanners and uh, a few other films uh, the Fangoria presents the best and bloodiest horror video magazine this is this is pretty cool has a bunch of different pictures and stuff and reviews of different uh, horror horror films uh, different horror horror films different horror films <laughs> Wonder what a horror horror film is. <laughs> uh, another Fangoria. The rest are just Fangoria. Uh, this one uh, shows Amityville 3D and a few other things. Uh, th this is uh, one with Rawhead Rex from Beyond. Uh, this one shows uh, Friday the Thirteenth Part Eight, and it's a, a Tear Within and has a special. Uh, section that is all about Friday the 13th. Uh, this is a later one uh, with Insidious. Uh, it, it came with a lot. I'm not really a big fan of the later Fangorias. I mean, the Fangorias I want to get are the ones from the 80s and up to the mid to late 90s. Like, that's that's about it for me, really. And I got a good amount of them, so. Um, and this one talks about uh, Nightmare 5 as well as uh, Friday the 13th Part 8. So, um, yeah, those are the Fangorias that I got recently. And now we are getting into the finale, which will be excuse me. Um, I, I just had to do a little something. My computer was making a weird noise. It does that every now and then it's fine. It's, it's just, it's just something the computer does. So, um, this is the, uh, Death Wish, uh, letter that Jonathan sent me, so I'm going to read it. Um, uh, I hope you enjoy these gifts. More gifts coming early May for your birthday, even Basket Case, uh, Limited Edition and others, which I did get, which thank you once again, Jonathan. Death Wish should be a nice upgrade to your DVD, and so the remake is decent. Yeah, well, initially I thought it was decent, but I, I really want to watch it again, because in the theater, there were some things I liked about it, but there were other things that I'm like, eh, on. And I'm going to revisit that one when I watch uh, the other Death Wish films, and then I'll know for sure what my thoughts are on it. Hope you enjoy Cowboy Bebop the movie, the awesome adult animated sci-fi action thriller that's like Blade Runner and Total Recall. I bet you remember the show on Cartoon Network. I actually don't, because I didn't really watch Toonami. I know uh, uh, my cousin did, and a lot of my friends did, but... Excuse me, for but for whatever reason, I never really got into it. Heavy Metal should be a nice upgrade to your DVD. It definitely is. Uh, Dark Crystal 4K Anniversary Edition has visually stunning new 4K restoration that is so good. You think that it was filmed last year. And nice to see one of your uh, one of the greatest fantasy films of practical effects movies of all time. Look better than ever, just like Labyrinth Anniversary Editions, Blu-rays, picture quality restoration and 4K Looking so good, you think it was made in 2015. There's even a prequel to show The Dark Crystal coming out on Netflix with practical effects, puppetry, puppetry CGI combined uh, this Thanksgiving. Huh, so I guess this November. All right, a Dark Crystal prequel on Netflix. All right. Uh, Christmas or January of next year. Okay, maybe it's not Thanksgiving. Maybe it's later. Pumpkinhead and Manhunter should be nice upgrades to your DVDs. Both have great crisp. Both have great crisp. What? They have crisp. Uh, they both have great picture quality, and I hope you enjoyed the director's cut of Manhunter, which is almost like a different film, even with its alternate ending. Hmm. Uh, there's actually there actually was not just one Riddler episode in the Batman anime series. There were more than one. There are more Riddler episodes. Etrigan the Demon didn't appear until the fourth season of the series. Glad you enjoyed the Red Turtle. Um, and your first exposure to Studio Ghibli movie, which are the kings of anime in Japan, besides Madhouse and TMS. So how many stars do you give Jumanji, Welcome to the Bung Hole, Blade Runner 1 and 2, The Shape of Water, Baby Driver, Atomic Blonde, Bright, Wind River, Itanya, The Abyss, and Akira. Okay, alright. <clears throat> Jumanji, Welcome to the Bung Hole. I I'll give that one star. Uh, Blade Runner, I'll give four and a half. 
Blade Runner 2049, I'll give four stars. Uh, the Shape of Water, I will give... I, I would say five. I really love that movie. Baby Driver, uh, three and a half. Atomic Blonde, two stars. Bright, four. Wind River, four. I, Tonya, four and a half. Uh, the Abyss, five. And Akira, four and a half. And those are all out of five stars, by the way. Glad you enjoyed Akira. Nice review on it. Definitely my fave anime movie for a long time since it was middle was since I was in middle school. Forgive me, my reading is just absolute garbage right now for some reason. Um, it's, uh, definitely my fave anime movie for a long time since I was in middle school in the mid '90s when I rented it. So, is it your fave anime movie to date now? I would say, uh, yeah, for right now, yeah. Uh, that might change with more anime that I see, but for right now, sure. Great animation and some neat action sequences. Hollywood has definitely inspired my anime in some movies. You can even tell his Chronicle was like Akira-inspired. Uh, yet you don't think Akira's score is memorable? To me, it's a memorable score, and Kaneda's theme is iconic, no doubt. Yeah, it, just, it didn't really stand out to me that much. But that's just me personally. Yeah, Last Jedi was quite disappointing. Agree with you there. Nice reviews you did on Batman Begins and Dark Knight. Glad you appreciated them. Appreciate them on other viewings, but not Dark Knight Rises. Begins was the closest thing to a live-action Year One movie. As you can tell, how much it borrowed from Year One with a bit of Dreams and Darkness from the animated series, and the Dark Knight was a bit like The Killing Joke. Hathaway was nowhere near as good as Pfeiffer, you thought. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> There's only one Catwoman for me, and it's Michelle Pfeiffer. Uh, I thought both were lovely ladies, no doubt, for the role of the Catwoman. Yeah. I thought Michelle Pfeiffer, Michelle Pfeiffer was the top. Uh, she was the best. The best there was. The best there ever will be. And Anne Hathaway couldn't... She could not hold a claw to uh, Michelle Pfeiffer. Yeah, speaking of Batman Returns, have you noticed that Batman TAS, TAS that Selena Kyle had set her costume, and Penguin uh, look like their movie counterparts, seasons 1 to 3 before redesigns in season 4? Yeah, a little... Definitely. Penguin looks a little different. He's not as gross looking, but yeah. Um, because Bruce, Tim, and Paul Dini loved Burton's movie in 1989 so much they wanted to do an animated series in Batman, which they greenlighted in 1990. Thus, production began in 1991, yet in late in May 1991, during first production of Batman Returns. Warner Brothers sought to have all the audiences who loved 1989's movie and soon returns the next year to have the animated series released the same year, so audiences of all ages and even adults get interested in the series. It has some small Burton ties like Jack Napier, the Duckmobile from Returns, and even the Michelle Pfeiffer blonde Selena to DeVito-looking Penguin. So Tim and company did it and worked like a charm as the audiences who dug the movies enjoy the animated series. As it was a blockbuster show that came out weekday week afternoons and some Sunday nights to attract adult, even teen viewers, it became a pop culture phenomenon. Tim and Deanie, however, dissatisfied with the designs on Selena and Penguin for the fourth season that was on Warner Brothers. They redesigned them to the original designs they intended with, Sel with Selena with black hair and Penguin as an ordinary looking human guy without flippers or long hair as in Gotham Adventures comic that ties to the animated series. There's a reason Selena stopped being blonde as it was just a dye job as she found her dye was made from animals and stopped using it as she went back to her actual hair color being dark. Yet, Season 4 may have some designs you don't approve of, as some fans did, but still has some good episodes like Mad Love, uh, the Harley Origin Story, which is adopted from the Batman Adventures comics, and Joker does look like Yakko Warner, a Muppet with a bit of damn backslide from that classic Chuck, jo Chuck Jones, made Mary Mel Melody Short, the Dover Boys of Pimento University, yet Catwoman's costume looked like Pfeiffer's costume on that season with the black look, yet the pasty face in the costume looks like the poster of a patsy face Catwoman on Batman Returns cover art. Scarecrow did look scary in season 4 of the new design, plus Jeffrey Combs voiced him in season 4, which is a nice touch to see Her Herbert West voiced him. Yeah, I agree. I mean, uh, that I agree with all that. I can't wait for uh, the Blu-ray release of uh, the animated series on Blu-ray. Supposed to come out this year. I haven't heard anything else from Warner Brothers, though, about it. Funny rant on Night Towers. I agree that movie sucks ass indeed. I rented it when I was when I was 11, 25 years ago. Hoping to have Robert England be the main star and be creepy like the cover, but it turned out to be a David Lynch wannabe movie. And what was with that naked guy on the horse? I have no fucking idea what was up with that naked guy on the horse. Uh, I'd rather it be a hot red-headed red 
or a blonde or brunette woman instead of some dude. I totally agree with you there, Jonathan. Uh, I agree. Hooper's worst, worst film, no doubt. Invaders from Mars is quite a bummer indeed. I saw it in a video when I was four when it first came out. thought it was quite lame despite good effects by Winston, yet the ending was a cop-out indeed. I kind of like It 2017. You're right about Pennywise. He was weak. I think Jim Carrey should have played the role. I think he would have nailed it. Huh. Interesting. I don't know, but interesting. Uh, part two might be better since you always like the adult half of the story. Uh, as a kid of half the story, you've seen done better in the Monster Squad or Goonies or Stand By Me. Uh, yeah, actually, I, I am kind of curious about the uh, sequel because of that. And I don't mind the cast. I think they did a good job. So we'll see. Um, yet I bet Amy Adams will play adult Beverly. Uh, actually, no, I think I think it's uh, J uh, Jessica Chastain. I think that's who it is. Um, at the Comic-Con two months ago, I met, so I spoke with Vanessa Angel, and she's still as lovely as ever. In her early 50s and has aged well. Did you hear about Night of the Lepus coming to Blu-ray from Scream? Yeah, I did. Uh, yeah. Warner Brothers is finally licensing some of their titles for Scream. Maybe we might get Critters 1 and 2. Uh, Creepshow Collector's Edition. Uh, uh, Razorback Collector's Edition of Beetlejuice. Maybe even Freddy's Nightmares. I doubt about Freddy's Nightmares. But um, Critters 1 and 2, that would be great. I could definitely see that happening. Creepshow, I think, might be happening because I've been hearing some from some people on Facebook that are kind of buddy buddies of people at Scream, uh, are kind of throwing hints out that there might be some Creepshow Blu-ray, um, and um, so yeah, so that is uh, the letter from uh, Jonathan, the first one. Uh, he also said, "Can't wait for your Spawn reviews and and a few other reviews and stuff like that." So. Um, so yeah, thanks again to Jonathan for sending me that. Um, there's going to be a, a awkward little bit of an edit here because I'm going to take a little bit of a break because all this reading is just, just a lot and my allergies are starting to act up a little bit. So there'll be a quick cut and then I will get, uh, then there will be, uh, another portion while, where I will be reading the most recent letter that, uh, Jonathan sent me. So stay tuned. Uh, I will see you real soon. All right, so um, here we have the uh, second uh, letter. Uh, this is the most recent letter from Jonathan. Um, so, uh, dear Mike, I hope you enjoy these gifts. I'm going to send you more in late J July or early August, especially in the Mouth of Madness Collector's Edition. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. I uh, hope It's Alive Trilogy Blu-rays and upgrade your DVDs. Uh, because It's Alive's new 2K restoration restoration is so good, you'd be hard-pressed to, to think that it was made in 1974. Uh, same for Unknown Origins 2K restoration, and Killer Clown's new 4K restoration is flawless, as you would think it was a new movie made last year, year then in 1988. Hope you enjoy Pompoco, as it has Clancy Brown in the English dub, and from Studio Ghibli, which is uh, Miyazaki's studio. I agree on your Ball Busters review. I think it's time that they should leave the franchise alone. Ghostbusters never needed to be continued in film. They couldn't get a cast reunion together outside the video game after Harold Ramis died. Any idea about a third film should have been put to rest. They had plenty of material to work with with the franchise and other mediums. It didn't need saving as a film franchise. It left enough for of a legacy as a pop culture icon of the 80s to stay as a two-film series. The problem is, film studios are too greedy for their own good and think that established franchise films coming back hold some kind of guaranteed profit margins based on brand name alone. Nobody is smart enough to look at a brand like Ghostbusters and properly and effectively determine the best ways to utilize it based on the fan base and the legacy it holds. Now that's very some very poignant words there, Jonathan. Um, I could not have said it better myself. Look at Back to the Future as an example of utilizing the brand in ways that don't mess with the legacy it left with an unnecessary remake or sequel. They show enormous respect to the fan base, coming out with different merchandise and apparel and media over the years. You know they can't. Re they know that you can't re recreate the magic they had, so they let the franchise live on through the fans' love of the trilogy. Ghostbusters did so well with the video game that gave their fans something so authentic and respectful to the films. It was such a shame they had to go to the route they did for Ghostbusters 2016 in order to bank off its name. I'm very thankful the new film flopped at the box office and how it killed the franchise and sometimes it's better to kill something than to let it suffer. 
This franchise is now like a wounded, half-dead animal since the real Ghostbusters ended, and nothing else good has came out in the last 25 years with the exception of the 2009 video game and the merchandise and the comics by IDW. No movies since then and other games during the years have sucked. Stream Ghostbusters was an okay show, and this new movie flopped at the box office. I'd like to see Extreme Ghostbusters. Like, I haven't seen the show in a long time, but uh, every uh, link I see has the same crappy Toon Disney uh, recordings, which Toon Disney did this dumb thing back in the day where every time they'd have anything air on their channel, they'd have this annoying fucking giant uh, red and yellow Toon Disney watermark in the bottom, of the, uh, left of the, the right, I think it's the left, or I actually think it's the right, actually, I'm, I'm all directionally confused, uh, the right bottom of the screen, I'm all out of it, I don't know, I know, it's, it's just like, what, what the fuck, what are you talking about, uh, just in the bottom of one, one of the sides of the screen, there, there's this annoying watermark, and it's just, it, it, it covers up, like, a whole, part of the entire show like it, it's it's i should not have to be staring at a toon disney logo the whole time while i'm trying to watch a tv show it's just a terrible fucking decision process if anybody remembers that i mean because that was a long time ago it's like early 2000s or something like that when toon disney was still a thing um you just can't recapture the same lightning in a bottle like the original as the original focus on a brilliant mature intelligent script and reminded how well-crafted it is, a supernatural fantasy comedy adventure with horror trimmings, a solid cast of talented comedy actors who are given just enough space to subtly give wit around without undermining the world of the story. It has an edge to it in the original as the, ri edge to it in the original as the original is what I call great filmmaking. The new version hits some viewers in the face with painfully forced, forced juvenile Sandler, modern Sandler, mind you, Esquire-esque humor. Poorly written, unfunny script, poor pacing, plus no passion, but money grab, plus none of the edge of the original movie, and a lame villain who lacks the menace of Gozer and Vigo. This shows what 80s and 90s comedy did right, and what some modern comedy is doing wrong. Not to mention shooting the logo in the dick as a bad guy, which is an insult to the franchise, and there's no passion in this remake, just a cash grab made by Sony. I have a few female friends who thought this remake was poorly written, sexist towards men, and one of my lady friends says it's an unfunny insult to women with such a man-hating agenda. And well, I enjoyed a few of Fag's move Fag's movies. I felt he was the wrong guy for this project, and even he didn't want to do it at first, but he had to too for a paycheck, and he felt out of his comfort zone, as R-rated films is what he is good at, and not big-budget PG-13 films. As after this flopped, he should go back to doing original stuff. Which apparently is what he's doing. He's doing some uh, thriller, which I like the editing in the trailer, but it looked kind of generic. But I don't know. Um, seems like he's going back to his wheelhouse, so good for him. Ho uh, Hollywood needs to focus on making good films and focus on the new franchises like Jack Reacher. Uh, yeah, uh, make a better uh, third Jack Reacher if you're going to do another one. Uh, Born, John Wick, not digging up some old favorite franchises. Well, Born, I I think they should just be done with that franchise. The last film was so boring that uh, I really don't want to see any more. Uh, not digging up some old favorite franchises and desperately sucking the dried up blood of corpses into some focus group approved, poorly written piece of junk. Ghostbusters is left alone. They should have made Ghostbusters three years ago, like in the 90s. And now that Harold Ramis is dead, so has Ghostbusters. So has Ghostbusters. Studios need to rediscover the spirit that made the great series, series slash movies, not keep recycling past glories. I mean, you're, you're just you're just totally knocking out of the park here, Jonathan, um, for sure. <clears throat> Sorry, forgive me. Just uh, all of a sudden, just allergies just kicking my ass. I also agree with your rant on bringing back horror icons on the screen, and after seeing Halloween's 2018 trailer, I'm not impressed as the cinematography looks drab and all that. And Jamie did it for a paycheck. I think it's time they need to leave Chucky, Michael, Leatherface, Freddy, Jason, and Pinhead. With Ghostface alone, a good thing uh, the latest Leatherface film was a flop, just like Jigsaw. As Saw 2 was ran into the ground, or no one gave a fuck last year for a new movie, as they knew when it quit. New Hellraiser films suck, and so does post Child's Play 3 Chucky films. I think Brad is getting tired of Chucky. Scream 4 chucked and flopped in theaters, as it was a lame film, and Scream ended with 3. Elm Street remake sucked as Robert is Freddy, 
Supporting your cause and not supporting classic iconic horror characters returning to the big screen for enough is enough. Sometimes it's better to kill horror characters returning to the big screen uh, than let it suffer. Um, you say, yeah, sometimes it's better to kill something than let it suffer. Those franchises are now like fatally wounded dying soldiers that were shot in the field of war many times and are suffering as they're crawling to fellow soldiers behind boulders, asking them to kill them so they won't suffer anymore. Is that what you see these franchises with iconic horror characters as wounded fatally dying soldiers? Or wounded half dead animals suit too. I don't support their life supports as the plug should be pulled. I think they're already dead. I think they've been dead for a long time. They're they're resuscitated corpses. They're like reanimated uh, zombies. That's what they are. Um, they should be shot in the head um, so they won't be shuffling around anymore trying to search for a uh, new life. You and Rambo Raff for life's message is loud and clear. We need to more fresh new horror icons and new horror franchises like Wolf Cop, Conjuring, Tucker and Dale, to new icons like Annabelle, Babadook, Leslie Vernon, Captain Spaulding, and more. Just retire the older horror franchises already. It's becoming jokes at this point. Halloween needs to let them rest in peace and let old glory rest and come up with new glory, new icons. Your podcast is a wake-up call for those horror fans like you who are fed up on what they have done to these old cl classic horror icons like the Universal Monsters back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Let the older franchise live on through merchandise, physical media, comics, and streaming of the old movies so generations can see these classic franchises for what they were. Like Judd Crandall said, sometimes dead is better. And ain't he right? He's right. He's, you know, it's, it's true. It's damn true. Seventh sign, recollection screen for help, and never had a DVD or Blu-ray release, Blu -ray, blah, 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 Blu release before, and has its fans as it was bootlegs, and now it's on Blu-ray, Brain Dead, uh, The Evil, or the best announcement from Screen Factories in September. Well, we get Garbage by Exorcist 2 and Texas Chainsaw Massacre 4 and Collector's Editions. And Mac and Me, which just, uh, the, the features were just announced. They're not much. I don't know why it's called a Collector's Edition. I really don't. It's just an audio commentary and a couple new interviews, and a couple interviews. Like, there are, there are Blu-rays that I have from Screen Factory and Shout that have more features that aren't called Collector's Editions. So, that's just a waste of the Collector's Edition Nable. Uh, Nable? <laughs> the waste, uh, waste of the... Uh, <laughs> fuck, I'm just so out of it for some reason. Forgive me. It's a waste of the Collector's Edition label. Um, I hope in October we get better announcements in the end of this month, early and next month, like Critters movies, uh, collector's editions of like Beetlejuice, Tremors, Child's Play 2 and 3. I doubt Child's Play 2 and 3 are going to happen because Warner Brothers, uh, not Warner Brothers, I should think, you know, Universal. Universal just recently released a box set with all the Chucky films. I don't think they're going to give Universal... I mean, Universal's going to give themselves... Well, I don't think they're going to give themselves a chance to do a collector's edition because they don't give a shit. But uh, I don't think they're going to give Scream Factory a shot. But we'll see. Maybe they're waiting until the Comic-Con. We all need more Warner Brothers, Sony Universal, Universal titles, even ITC titles like Company of Wolves. Yes, please. Company of the Wolves collector's edition. I totally see that. Or Alligator. What do you think of Season 2 of Tales from the Crypt? Uh, season 2, Tales from the Crypt, My Brother's Keeper, and The Secret. Uh, season 3 is Reluctant Vampire, Albert Cadaver, Ease Okilia, and Yellow. But Season 4 is None But the Lonely Heart, and This Okilia. My Brother's Keeper, I'm trying to remember which one that is. Is that the one with the, 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 uh, Siamese twin, like the people, the, the, the conjoined twins? If that's it, I really enjoyed that episode. I have a lot of fun with that. I think the two actors work well with, they really work well with each other and they're just they're just a lot of fun to watch um the secrets yeah that the secrets not the secrets okay it's honestly one of my least favorite it comes across more as a tales from the dark side episode but with gore although i did like larry drake's performance um the reluctant vampire uh, I really like Reluctant Vampire. That's a lot of fun. Uh, Malcolm McDowell, I believe it's, or is it, or is it, or is it Rodding McDowell? I think it's Rodding McDowell. Um, I think it's Rodding McDowell. It might be Malcolm. I think it's Malcolm actually. I think it's Malcolm McDowell. Um, I get confused because they both have the same. They have the same last name. Um, Abercadaver. Uh, that's one of my all-time favorite episodes. Uh, Bo Bridges is fantastic in it, as is Tony Goldwyn. Um, I really enjoy it. I, I, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a real winner. 
Evil Kill You, that's another great one with Tim Roth. Uh, very tragic uh, episode. Well acted. Yellow. Yellow's not one of my favorites, but it's still it's still well acted, well put together. It's just not what I really associate with Crypt normally. It's more of a war story of, uh, episode, um, but it's good. Dan Aykroyd's good in it, so is uh, uh, Lloyd Bridges and, and uh, one of his younger younger sons. I think it's Lloyd Bridges. No, it's not your, Lloyd. It's Kirk Douglas. Sorry. It's uh, Kirk Douglas and uh, his son. Not Michael Douglas, his other son. Season 4 is None But the Lonely Heart and This Will Kill You. None But the Lonely Heart, I, I have a lot of fun with. I think that's the one with uh, Treat Williams. And This Will Kill You, I'm trying to remember that one. It's not, it's not coming to my mind for some reason. I don't know why. Like, it, this just not popping in there. One of these days I will review uh, Tales from the Crypt, so um, you'll hear more of my thoughts more in depth at that point. Uh, so for October, you're going to do more anthology movies uh, with uh, Creep Show, Tales from the Dark Side, Cat's Eye, Body Bags, Tales from the Hood, and more. Uh, maybe. Um, I mean, that's initially kind of what I want to do, but there are some other uh, horror franchises I was thinking about maybe revisiting. Uh, Halloween, because the reviews I did for those were such a long time ago, and uh majority of them were done in podcast form. So yeah, um... Anyway, um, thanks again, Jonathan, for the gifts and for the support and all the kind words and for the letters. Um, and I'm just going to talk about a few things. Uh, specifically, there's this bit of movie news uh, coming out. Well, not there's no release date yet. It's in the preliminary pre-production phase. Uh, James Wan and his production company have announced that they're going to be working on a remake of this movie. Now, I, now I've heard that it could be a reboot. Whatever, doesn't matter. This film is as perfect as you could ask a film like this to be. A PG-13 horror action-adventure comedy. Um, it's a wonderful mix of all three of those elements. And I don't think you could do any better than it. I, I really didn't. I mean, definitely not in terms of the lead. You're not going to do better with any cast member nowadays than Jeff Daniels. I'm sorry. And uh, Frank Marshall did a great job directing it. And uh, I just don't I don't see a reason for an upgrade. Are they going to make it super serious and dark? Well, that doesn't work. That that I mean, why? Why would you do that? That's what that's pointless to me. Um, are you going to make it rated R? So there's a bit of extra gore. Doesn't matter to me. Um what, what you gonna do PG-13 again and just have a bunch of CGI spiders? Like, what? what is the point? Like, it's, why is this? Why does it keep happening? Every fucking year, like Clockwork, one of my favorite films is announced for a remake. Every fucking year. When is it gonna end? When is this shit gonna end? This remake should be squashed like a bug and never happen. I hope it never gets to production. I really do, because there's no point to this. There's been a bunch of other movies that have come out after Arachnophobia that have tried to do the same thing with a harder edge, or with more uh, giant spiders, or with whatever. There's no need for a remake of Arachnophobia. I think what Hollywood needs to do is develop a case of remake of phobia you know, where they're so... Cripply, they're, they're so afraid of another bomb in theaters that they get a crippling fear of making any more remakes. That's what I think needs to happen. So, um, so I definitely wanted to briefly mention that and uh, give you an update on what's coming up next. I uh, got a review of Upgrade, which will be posted pretty soon. One of... I would say the biggest disappointment of the year so far for me. I will explain why soon enough. And um, I will also be posting reviews of A Cure for Wellness, At Close Range, Baby, Secret of Lost Legend, and Backdraft. And uh, a few others after that because I'm still getting into uh, the list of requests. The long, long list. Um... 
And I will also be posting a few other things like a new podcast. I might be posting a section of, of the podcast, uh, Celluloid Nation, that I recorded with Matt uh, a few days ago. I might be posting the section where we talk about the Halloween trailer early um, because it's a pretty big chunk of the podcast. and The podcast is a bit too long with it in there. So I'll probably post that separately as episode 11 um, and then post episode 12 maybe on the weekend or some other time. And, um, any other, you know, maybe a few other random things. I got a, a, a couple collection videos I want to do. And, um, so, uh, yeah, that's pretty much what I got uh, coming up on my channel. I uh, hope you all enjoyed this long video, but, um, there were a lot of things I wanted to show you. Um, once again, huge thanks goes out to Brandon and Jonathan, uh, for sending, uh, these wonderful gifts. Also a big, equally as big thanks goes to you. For supporting this channel and uh, for watching. And as always, I will see you later. See ya.